Hi, today we're going to look at the exam 4 review for on-ramps college algebra. Problem 1. The polynomial 2x cubed minus 128 can be factored into the form a times x plus b times x squared plus cx plus d. Write the correct values for the variables below. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my equation that they gave me, my 2x cubed minus my 128, and I'm going to see can I factor anything out of that. And I can see they're both even, so I'm going to factor out a 2. That's going to leave me with 2x cubed minus 64. So then what I'm going to notice is my 64 is a perfect cube and my x cubed is a perfect cube. So I'm going to have 2 times, this is really x cubed minus 4 cubed. So then I can take this binomial and I can expand it using my rules for cubic factorization. What I'll end up with is 2 and then when I factor this difference of cubes I'm going to have the x minus the 4, and then it's going to be the x squared plus my two terms multiplied together, so x times 4, 4x, four plus the square of the second term, 4 squared is 16. All right, so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look back up here. a is the number in front, and then it's x plus b. And then it's x squared plus cx plus d. And this allows me to see what my letters are. a is 2. b is supposed to be plus b, but I have a negative 4 here, so I need to make sure I carry that negative with it. c is 4. And d is 16. Number two, given the polynomial f of x equals negative 3 times x plus 5 squared, x minus 1, x plus 6 squared, identify the degree, leading term, and end behavior. So I can tell what my degree is going to be based on what my exponents are. I know when I multiply this out, I'm going to have x times x. That's going to give me x squared. That's just going to be an x. And then I'm going to have x times x again, so that's going to be an x squared. And then I'm going to be multiplying these three factors together. So I'm going to have an x squared, an x, and an x squared. So that's going to be 2, 3, 4, 5 x's when I multiply them all together. So my degree is going to be 5. Now what are they actually going to be when I multiply everything out? I know when I multiply these two together, I'm going to get x squared as the leading term of this. I'm just going to have an x as my leading term of this. And then I'm going to have an x squared as my leading term of this. So when I multiply these three together after I've expanded them, I know I'm going to lead with x to the fifth. But don't forget then that is going to be multiplied by negative 3. So my leading term is going to be negative 3 x to the fifth power. So that leads me into my end behavior of my graph. So I know if I'm graphing this function, I have a degree that's negative. So one end's going to go up, one end's going to go down. And then my leading term is negative. So that means it's going to have, we think of like a downward slope. So it's going to start up and it's going to end down because they're going to go in opposite directions. If this degree was even and this was positive, they would both go up. If this degree was even and this is negative, they would both go down. This being odd and this being negative, they're going to go downhill in opposite directions. If this is odd and this is positive, they're going to go uphill in opposite directions. So I don't know exactly what my graph is going to do in between, but I know what its end behavior is going to look like. As my x values go to the left, as they get towards negative infinity, I can see my graph is going up towards positive infinity. And as my x value approaches positive infinity, as my x's get bigger, I can see my graph is going, my y values are going down towards 
negative infinity. Let's look at number three. Number three, using long or synthetic division, divide x to the fourth minus x cube, 3x cubed plus 7x squared minus 60x minus 125 by x minus 5. Your quotient will be in the form x cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. Fill in the blanks below with the correct values for b, c, and d. All right, so what I'm going to do on this one is I am going to look at my x minus 5 to figure out what I'm dividing by because I'm going to go with synthetic division. It's a little bit faster, a little bit simpler. Okay, so for my synthetic division, I know I'm going to be dividing by x minus 5. When I set x minus 5 equals to 0, I just get 5. And then I have x to the fourth has a coefficient of 1 x to the third, negative 3, x squared, 7, x to the first, negative 60, and then x to the zero, negative 125. So that's how I set up my problem. Now I'm going to bring that first term down and multiply it to the 5 to get 5. Add these two together to get 2. Multiply it to the 5 to get 10. Add these two together to get 17. Multiply that to the 5. You may need to come off to the side and do 17 times. 5, that's going to be 35. 5, 6, 7, that's 85. Remember, you won't have use of a calculator on the test. When I add these together, that's going to be 25. And then 5 times 25 is 125. So I have a remainder of 0, which is what I was hoping for. This is going to be, I started with x to the fourth, so now I'm going to have 1x to the third plus 2x squared plus 17x to the first plus 25x to the zero. So then when I look here, it was x cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. So I can see B is 2, C is 17, and D is 25. Let's look at number 4. Consider the scatter plot of data given at the right. Circle the number or word that completes the sentences best. The most reasonable correlation for the coefficient for this data, I have negative 0.928. 0 0.327 and 9.45. When I come and look at the data, I can see it looks relatively linear. It definitely is going uphill in a linear pattern. So I can eliminate it's not going to be this one because that's not close to 1 and it's so it indicates we have scattered data. So now I need to do choose between these strong values. I can see my graph is going uphill, so it must be a positive correlation. It's a strong correlation in the positive direction, so this data has a strong positive trend. Number five, the function f of x is graphed below. One x-intercept of this function occurs at x equals blank with a multiplicity of. All right, so let's start looking. I'm just going to start with this first one here. Um, that is an x value of negative 2, and it's going straight through. There's no squiggles or anything, so that's a multiplicity of 1. Then I'm going to look at the next one here. That is a positive 2, and it has a multiplicity of. Now, this one's doing the little SC thing, right? It's making an S curve. So that's going to be a multiplicity of 3. Remember, if it touches the axis like this, if this was the axis along the bottom, that would be a multiplicity of 2 if it looks like a parabola when it touches. Okay, so that would be if it did something like that, that would be a multiplicity of 2. We don't have that in this graph. Okay, um, and then we still have that one last one. My third one here as x equals 5, and it's again going straight through, so that's going to be a multiplicity also of 1. Okay. The equation for this function is f of x equals a times x plus 2 
times x plus b to the c power times x plus d. Okay, this x plus 2, remember if I solve that for x plus 2 equals 0, that's going to be this one here. So that one's already taken care of my x plus 2, right? Because I'll end up with x equals negative 2 when I solve this equal to 0. This one is the only one that has an exponent. The only one that doesn't have a multiplicity of 3 or of 1 is this one. So that means this has to be the second line, okay? So this one has to be x plus, oh, not plus because it's 2 here, right? So that's going to have to be x minus 2. And we're going to be raised to that third power. And then, so then the only one we haven't touched is this one. So this has to be this last one where we're going to have, I have a positive 5 when I solve it. So that means in here it must be a negative 5. Now, I still have a variable. I still have this a. To find this a, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to write out this equation, pick a point from our graph, and solve it for a. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick this point right here. I usually like to pick one that I can see nice and pretty. This is the point 0, negative 5. So that's what I'm going to go with is 0, negative 5. And we're going to use this equation here. Instead of f of x, I'm going to use y equals, we don't know what a is. That's what we're going to try to find. And then I know I'm going to have x plus 2. And then I'm going to have x minus 2 to the third power. And then I know I'm going to have x minus 5. And we are going to substitute in the 0 as our x value. And we're going to substitute in the negative 5 as our y value. And solve this for a. So I'm going to have negative 5 equals a times 0 plus 2 times 0 minus 2 to the third power times 0 minus 5. All right, so negative 5 equals a times 2 times 2 to the third power times negative 5. Oh, that's a negative 2, right? 0 minus 2, negative 2 to the third power times negative 5. Okay. All right, so now let's go ahead and start solving this. Okay, so negative 5 equals a times 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 is negative 8. Negative 5. So negative 5 is equal to a times, let's see, negative 8 times negative 5 is a positive 40, and 40 times 2 is 80. I'm going to divide both sides by 80. And I'm going to get an a value of negative 1, 5 goes into 80, let's see, 80 divided by 5, 5 goes in there one time, 1 times 5 is 5, 6, 7, 8, bring down the 0, 5 times 6, that's 30, so 16, so that's going to be negative 1 16th as my value of a, if I did all of my math correct. We have negative 1 16th, which makes sense. My graph starts, if I look, my graph starts up and it ends down. So it makes sense that my a would be negative, right? So that makes sense that I have a negative a value. All right, so my a value is negative 1 over 16. My b value, it's plus b, and we have a minus 2, so I want to make sure I put that negative with it, negative 2. My c value is a 3, and my d value plus d, I have a minus 5, so plus a minus 5. There's my a, b, c, and d for problem number 5. Give me a chance.
chance to look at that whole thing if you need to see the whole thing at one time. Oops, I went too far. There you go. All right, let's look at number six. Okay, for number six, which of the following statements is true about the equation t equals k times r cubed over x? t is the total time, r is the radius of a sphere, and x is the arc length. Okay, so total time, t, varies inversely with the arc length. Arc length is x. All right, so varies inversely means t varies inversely k over x. X. So if I look at this problem that they gave me and I don't think about the r cubed because we're not worried about the r cubed in this problem, is this what I have? t equals k over x, t equal, it is. a is the correct answer to this one. Okay, so I can keep going on. If you wanted to look at the others, when I look at the others, for example, this one, so this is the same as the one before, except for the word directly which means I would be trying to look for t equals k times x, which we can see that's not my case here. And then here the cube of the radius varies inversely with the total time, so that would be the radius cubed, and then I would do k over total time. And so then if I solve this to try to make it look like this, because I do have a fraction, right? But if I solved this and I multiplied both sides by t to get the t out of the denominator, I'd have t times r cubed equals k, and then I'd have to divide the r cubed on both sides. And that is not what I have. t actually varies, or r cubed is not going to be varying inversely with the total time. It's going to actually be directly with the total time. So that is not correct either. And then the last one, the cube of the radius varies inversely with the, oh, I didn't actually write that up. You can see it after I got rid of that, r cubed. So you can see that's an inverse relationship there, but that's not what I have here. I have the r up with the k. Should be direct. Um, the cube of the radius, r cubed, varies indirectly with the arc length. So if I try to get this problem where the r is on the other side, we're going to have to divide it out, which means the r should be under a 1, right? Does that make sense? It's in the numerator right now, so to move it to the other side, I'd have to divide it out of both sides. So that that's not going to get me from here to here. So for example, let me show you. If I take this t equals k r cubed over x, let's see if we can try to make it look something like this, okay? I would have to divide out the r cubed so that I could get rid of that there. And so I'd end up with t over r cubed equals k over x. And so that r cube is not supposed to be in a denominator if this is an inverse variation written the way they have it. So that one does not work either. All right, let's look at 7. Using the rational zeros theorem, determine all the possible rational zeros for the polynomial function. So we need to identify our p, and we need to identify our q. We're going to find all the factors of p. So that's going to be plus and minus 1, 2, 5, and 10. And then we want all the factors of q, which is going to be just plus and minus 1 and plus and minus 3. So then it's every combination of P over Q. So that's going to be all of these over 1, which is just going to be the whole number. So plus and minus 1, plus and minus 2, plus and minus 5, plus and minus 10. 
And then we're going to do all of these again, but this time over 3. Remember, if you need to reduce to reduce, none of these do, but if they did, we'd want to reduce. 1 third, 2 thirds, 5 thirds, and 10 thirds. These are all of my possible rational zeros. Okay, let's look at number eight. You and a few of your classmates are trying to find an appropriate model for a set of data on your homework. Here are the group's regression findings for the data. So linear, my R value was 0.651. Quadratic, I had 0.968. And exponential, I had 0.825. So when I look at these, what can you and your group conclude from these R values? All right, so when I look at this, I can see it looks like my closest to one R value is the quadratic. So we can conclude our data is quadratic. Okay. Number nine, fill in the blanks in order to describe the polynomial graphed below. This polynomial is even or odd. Well, both of these, or for the degree. Remember, even and odd functions are different from even and odd degrees, okay? Um, for the degree on this one, both of my ends are going up, so I know this must have an even degree. My unique real roots are going to be 1, 2, and 3. And then my leading coefficient must be, since these are both going up, so they're going in the same direction, that makes me even. They're both going up, that makes me positive. So just as a reminder, this one for the degree that's going to be same direction is why they're even. And then we're positive because they're both up, right? If one of these was down, if this one over here was down, then we'd have an odd degree and it would be negative because the whole thing would be going down. If this end was down, we'd still have an odd degree because they'd be going in opposite directions, but we would be still positive because we'd be going uphill. If these are both facing down, this would still be even, but this would be negative. Oops, I went too far. All right, consider the polynomial h of x equals 5x cubed minus 12x squared plus 10. When you divide this polynomial by x minus 2, you get a quotient of ax squared plus bx plus c with a remainder of r. Fill in the blanks with the correct value for each variable. All right, so let's use synthetic division. So if I have x minus 2, I'm going to divide by, five, or by negative, positive 2 because I have a negative 2 in here x cubed has a coefficient of 5, x squared has a coefficient of negative 12, x to the first, I don't have an x to the first, right? I go 3, 2, and then straight to 0. So I don't have an x to the first, I have to put a 0 there to represent it. And then my x to the 0 is my 10. Okay, so when I solve this, my 5 is going to come down. 2 times 5 is 10 plus negative 12 is negative 2, times 2 is negative 4, plus 0 is negative 4, times 2 is negative 8, which is going to leave me with a positive 2 when I add that to 10. All right, so I started with x cubed, so now I've got 5x squared minus 2x to the first, minus 4x to the 0, and my remainder equals 2. Remember, we're looking at ax squared plus bx plus c, and my remainder. So a is 5, 
B is negative 2, C is negative 4, and my R is 2. All right, number 11, the last one on our review. You're given that x minus 5 is a factor of g of x equals 4x to the fourth plus 2x cubed minus 13x squared plus 4x minus 30. This one could be a lot of work or it might be a little work. We're just going to have to cross our fingers and hope for the best. I'm going to do synthetic division to get this down from a quartic to a cubic to factor that. All right. So I'm going to, I know this is, this divides into this evenly. So I'm going to start with a negative 5. x to the 4th is 1. x to the sec, to the 3rd is 2. x squared is negative 13. x to the 4th is, or sorry, 4, 3, 2. x to the 1st is 4. x to the 0 is negative 13. 30. I have everything accounted for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, negative 13, 4, and 30. Okay. My 1 is going to come straight down. 1 times negative 5 plus 2. Negative 5 times negative 3 is a positive 15. Plus a negative 13 is 2. Times negative 5 is negative 10 plus 4 is negative 6. Negative 6 times negative 5 is a positive 30, which gives me a 0 remainder, which confirms that, yes, this is a factor. So now I have, we started with x to the 4th, so now I've got x to the 3rd minus 3x squared plus 2x minus 6 and a remainder of 0. Now, I want to see if this factors, because I could do my p's and my q's and just keep on trying to divide. But that might take a long time, um, because my p's are going to be 1, 2, 3, and 6 over 1. So at least there's that means there's 8 different factors I could possibly try, 8 factors I could try. And what if it's the last one? I don't want to deal with that. So instead, first, I'm going to, before I have to deal with that, because I might have to, I'm going to see if I can factor this by grouping. Since it's a cubic, there's four terms. I might be able to factor it by grouping. I can see I can take an x squared out of both of these. If I take an x squared out, that's going to leave me with x minus 3 x squared times x is x cubed, x squared times negative 3 is negative 3x. So can I get an x minus 3 over here? Yes, if I factor out a 2. Oh, hallelujah. If I factor out a positive 2, 2 times x is 2x, and 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. So I can see my two factors are x squared plus 2 and x minus 3. And in order to, for these to be factors, these would have to equal 0. So let's, let's try the first one. x squared plus 2 equals 0. I'm going to subtract the 2. And then I need to get rid of that square, so I'm going to square root. Now when I square root this negative, I'm going to end up with a complex number. I'm going to end up with i square root of 2, which is non-real. This is asking me, what is the other real root? Well, that's not it. That is a root. It's just not a real root. It's a complex root. So I'm going to go to the x minus 3 equals 0. And when I add the 3 to both sides, x equals 3. That's a real number. 3 is my other real root for this problem. Okay, so those are your answers to your review for exam four. Hopefully that was helpful. If you have any questions, make sure you come into tutoring. I will try to be here tomorrow morning, bright and early, 8.15ish, if you have any questions before school tomorrow, because our test is tomorrow. 
third period. Thanks for watching.